The following program is rated PPV, QFC, and RM for poor production values, questionable fashion choices, and random mullets. I knew from the time I was five years old that I wanted to be a comedian. I remember I saw Bill Cosby on television and I said, that is what I want to be. And then my parents told me I could not be black, so I went for the comedy thing. I will be the first to admit it, I had a great childhood. I did not have to worry about things in the Midwest, like, like drive-by shootings. Uh, the, the worst we had to worry about was a walk-by wedgie. <laughs> hey, 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 oh, hey, man. See, when you're a kid, life should be divided into four seasons. Spring, summer, Halloween, Christmas. Those are the big four. Man, when springtime hit in Indiana, I was outside, I was running, I was getting holes in my jeans. Because that's your goal when you're a kid, get holes in your jeans. Our goal was by the end of the summer to have so many holes, we'd have nothing on but underwear and a belt loop. <laughs> my mother did not understand this. She kept patching them up with those huge cast iron patches. You know what I'm talking about? They would go from your crotch to your ankle. You could not run. My whole neighborhood, we ran like this. Now, after springtime came summertime, of course, and that meant baseball. None of this t-ball, coach pitch stuff. We did not coddle children in my day. We had a hard ball thrown at us from day one, from three feet away, <laughs> by a kid who's been held back four grades, <laughs> whose goal it was to kill us. We never hit the ball, the ball hit us. Take your base, where is it? I can't find it, where is it, where is it? Ow, ow. We got hurt because everything we did was dangerous. Everything. We'd get home from school, hop on our bikes, go off riding, without a helmet, without shoes, sometimes without clothes, we didn't care. <laughs> this is the things we did. First off, our jungle gyms did not have padding underneath. They had rocks. <laughs> rocks the janitor sharpened at night because he hated us. Swing sets. We did not have safety belts on our swing sets. The goal was to get as high as you could get and launch yourself into the stratosphere. We drove our go-karts directly into traffic. We ran through abandoned houses. We ran through creeks. We jumped out of trees with sheets, hoping they were parachutes. We threw lawn darts at each other. <laughs> Missed. We didn't have any kind of suntan lotion. We had peeling parties. That's what we had. I think you win. We blew up Barbies with M80s. When we got hungry, we ate paint chips. We inhaled a tube of airplane glue every single week. Our Halloween costumes were made out of asbestos, for goodness sake. But for safety, our mothers made us wait an hour after we ate before we swam. My father was the most honest person you'd ever want to meet, except when it came to stories about his childhood. And this was not that walking through 10 miles of snow story. No, 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 no. That was for amateurs. My father was raised in the Great Depression. We couldn't afford refrigerators, so I sold blocks of ice on my back door to door. These were huge blocks of ice. These were glaciers on... Dinosaurs were still stuck in the ice on my back. And I made five cents a year, and I, and I shared it with the other 20 families who lived in the one bathroom house. And every week we would go out and, and help those less fortunate than ourselves which, to my mind, were lepers and dead people. I couldn't figure out who could be less fortunate than my father's family. He had a story for everything. If I complained about my homework, homework. When I was a boy, we couldn't afford books. 
I had to go to the library and copy the entire encyclopedia by hand. We couldn't afford paper. I had to scratch it on the back of a sheet of ice and run it home before it melted. This man would not curse in our house because he didn't want to set a bad example. So whenever he got disappointed, he would just hang his head and go, ow, 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 ow. This would last for days. <laughs> ah! I, I must admit, I'm the one who disappointed him probably more than anybody else. Remember slime? <laughs> it was purple, gooey, ooey stuff that served no purpose other than to stain everything it touched. It was the antichrist of toys. <laughs> you don't give this to a nine-year-old boy. Because eventually you think to yourself, I wonder what would happen <laughs> if I ironed this. <laughs> in the floor. <laughs> My father came in, he saw it, Looked at me, looked at the slime. Ah! Ah, 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 ah! Now, if it had stopped there, I would have been happy. But my father was a big believer in a thing called discipline. <laughs> it's almost a concept that's not heard of today. Today it's more like, oh, do you feel badly about burning down the neighbor's house? <laughs> do you? Then you go out and play. <laughs> Not my house. We had one rule. Obey and live. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> my father had a three-foot-long wooden paddle from his college fraternity that he kept over his bed for easy access. Not saying you used it a lot, but you can still read Sigma Chi right here. <laughs> Mom kisses can heal anything. Got a hangnail? <laughs> Broken heart? <laughs> Catatonic schizophrenia? <laughs> now dads can't do this. Oh no, you can break your leg. Walk into your home, your dad will look over the paper. <laughs> Shake it off. <laughs> oh, not mom, though. No, no. I could be across the state, playing kickball, get the wind knocked out of me, or if mom was, she'd stop. <laughs> I think Bobby's been hurt. <laughs> Apron turns into a cape. <laughs> ba -ba -da -ba! Thank you, Mom. I'm better now. Thank you so much. The best way I can describe my mother is that she was sensitive. <laughs> Everything hurts. Didn't matter what it was. Hey, Mom, good dinner. Well, I try. <laughs> Mom, we liked the dinner. I do the best I can. <laughs> See, we just got used to it. Dad would be gone on a business trip. He'd call up. He'd say, how you doing? Oh, we're fine. How's your mom? Oh, she's crying. See you tomorrow. That's all. <laughs> Growing up, I had three religious experiences that changed my life. The first one happened when I was four years old. The boy next door to me, being much older and wiser than myself, he was six at the time, <laughs> told me that Satan lived under the manhole cover in our front yard. <laughs> and that some night soon he was going to come up and take my entire family down to hell. I was four years old. What was I supposed to do? I lived in fear. Every morning, I, I would run out to the breakfast table. Oh, Mom, Dad, you're still here. Oh, good. Oh, oh. 
and he'd come over every afternoon. Are they gone yet? <laughs> then they will be tonight. I mustered up all my courage, went out to the manhole cover, and yelled down. <laughs> Satan! This is Bobby Lee. Please be my friend. <laughs> Don't drag my family down to hell. Take the boy next door, he'll fit right in. <laughs> and I looked up, and my mother and my sister were standing on the porch to our house, <laughs> laughing at me. I was doing this for them. I was befriending Satan himself for them. And they laughed. And they laughed for years. I can remember coming home from junior high school, walking down the hallway. My sister was in the bathroom yelling over the toilet, Satan! Please be my friend! Don't take my hairbrush down the hill! I loved school. I had so much fun in school. Especially the first day. Remember the first day? You got the list. Supply day. First item, crayons. Box of 64, sharpener in the back, left them in the car, melted on the dash. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> notebook. Had to get the big blue notebook. The, the thing had to be Charles Atlas to try and open. Remember that? And those things were so spring-loaded, if you put the paper in wrong and it snapped shut on your arm, kids would be running down the hall, help! 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 <laughs> Most useless purchase? Kleenex. I'm in second grade. I have sleeves. Duh. <laughs> Rounded edge safety scissors. So safe, they couldn't even cut. <laughs> the most you could do with these at craft time was origami. <laughs> and in keeping with the safety theme, we had the compass of death. <laughs> Remember this? One inch pencil attached to a four inch lawn dart. <laughs> You're supposed to draw circles with it. We were not coordinated. Invariably, some in our class was stabbed. And all you could do until the nurse showed up was just draw a circle around the wound there. <laughs> now, it may surprise some of you to know that I was kind of a smart aleck. <laughs> and as such, I spent the majority of my early learning years out in the hallway. <laughs> and I was homeschooled, which is what really, really hurt. <laughs> now, when I was growing up, Halloween was not evil. It was nice. We had parades, we had picnics. We would go to Woolworths and get our costume for $1.50 tops. One size fit nobody. <laughs> Remember that? You tied up behind her neck, had a picture of who you're supposed to be on your chest. <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> who are you, little boy? <laughs> well, I'm Spider-Man. Remember we had those cheap, cheap, cheap plastic masks? You didn't need the elastic strap because you sweat so much it stuck to your face! <laughs> had an air hole about this big, so no matter who you're supposed to be, you sounded like Darth Vader. <laughs> who are you, little boy? Spider-Man. <laughs> Got a king-size pillowcase. Started off about noon. <laughs> Hit every state in a tri-state area. When you got a hernia, you came home. <laughs> that was Halloween. And then came the best part. And that was trading. <laughs> and this only worked if you had a younger brother or sister. Because <laughs> you dump their candy, and you dump your candy, and you negotiate. 
Hey, you hate milk duds. I remember that. No, you told me that. You hate milk duds. Those are bad. Ooh, Nestle's Crunch is bad for your teeth. Let me help you out there. That's bad for you. Okay. Slow folks. Ooh, you'll never finish those. Let me take those off your hands. Here. Hey, you get all of my black stuff. That's yours. That's good eating. All righty. It, it has changed so much. I have to go out with my kids now. I take a police scanner, a flashlight, and a bullhorn. <laughs> Attention neighbors, two trick-or-treaters are coming to your front door. Throw out the candy and step away from the porch. Thank you. Have a pleasant Halloween. <laughs> I love Christmas because we had snow. I'm sorry, if you don't have snow, you're just having Thanksgiving late. But there was something that happened to the parents in the neighborhood. When the first snowfall hit, they would send their children out caroling door to door. What kind of sick tradition is this? <laughs> our boots were filled with snow. Our mittens frozen solid. We had snot scarves across our face. <laughs> God rest you, Mary, gentlemen. Please let us come inside. With my boot in the snow, I would write, help me. <laughs> I think some of those parents are trying to thin the herd, personally. <laughs> Grandpa, same gift every year. Bottle of Old Spice. Never bought a bottle. Went to his medicine cabinet, swiped it, wrapped it up, gave it back to him. <laughs> One bottle could last years with Grandpa. One year, though, I got creative. Now, maybe you've given this, maybe you have received this. Pencil holder. You get a big old orange juice can. You wrap it in construction paper. You put Merry Christmas and macaroni. I love you in Cheerios. You write your name in glue. You put sprinkles over it. It's a work of art. I wrapped it up, gave it to Grandpa. Forgot that Grandpa's hands shook. When he unwrapped it, he took the construction paper off with it. <laughs> did not even look at it. Just, just didn't know if they just threw it away. I have never seen a more confused man in my entire life. <laughs> Who got me an orange juice can? Grandma's on the side. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> a great part of my life, I must admit, with girls, I was a confirmed agnostic. I believe they existed, I just had no personal conversion experience. I went from nothing, nothing, to six foot tall, 60 pounds, 20 of which were in my feet. You could push me over, I would come right back up. <laughs> so, of course, they put me on the basketball team. I was the tallest just by virtue of my neck. <laughs> I never got off the bench once. I did not play one single minute of basketball. To this day, if you ask me to play basketball, I will suit up and sit down for two hours. That's just... That's just how I play the game. I think there is a chasm between the sexes that you cannot even fathom until you are in the thick of the battle. I'll give you three examples. Number one, thank you notes. No man alive even knows that these things exist until the day they get married. You give a man a gift, he says, thank you, if you're lucky, and that's pretty much the end of it. You give a woman a gift, it becomes an emotional Broadway production. Oh. They 
to run home and write a thank you note to remind you that they thanked you. <laughs> My wife always said, well, why don't you write thank you notes? How will the people know that you like what they got you? And I always say, I didn't give it back, did I? <laughs> Men are just not made this way. If we wrote thank you notes, it'd come out like this. Dear Bill, thank you very much for the lovely barbecue spatula set. I shall think of you every time I sear flesh on the grill. <laughs> Up to this point, I've been using my fingers in a screwdriver, so this will really come in handy. Sadly, I must return the lovely apron you gave me, as my wife says it makes my hips look big. <laughs> With fondest affection, Bob. You know, it's just, it's just not us. Been married for 16 years now. And, and, and she's a wonderful, nurturing, caring, loving woman. Now that that's out of the way, let me say something here. <laughs> she asks me the strangest questions at two in the morning when I'm out cold. I just feel this tap on my shoulder and I hear, Robert? When I hear that, I know I'm dead. <laughs> tap again, Robert? What? If you were blind, <laughs> do you think you could pick my body out? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, how many women are in this contest? to give it a shot. <laughs> that was the wrong answer. Before marriage, men will go voluntarily to a club and dance. After we get married, legally, we don't have to. <laughs> now, every time my wife asks me to dance, I go, wait a minute, let me check my schedule. Oh, look, we're still married. Look. So we had to compromise. In my house, that's the art of doing what my wife wanted to do in the first place. <laughs> so we agreed that we would go watch dance, which meant the ballet. Here's how to get out of ever going to the ballet a second time. Laugh. I did not mean to laugh. It just struck me funny. <laughs> These guys in ballet are not normal. Their butts start up here, okay? That's where they start, right there. You can set glasses up there and they will stay. And the guys in ballet hate the women. I don't know if they're upset, what's going on, but they're always picking up the women and moving them somewhere else. I don't like you here, I want you over here. You should go over here. The women have got to hate this. Excuse me, I just walked on my toes to get over there. And now I've got to do it again. And so the women, they join forces, they link arms and they go as a little group. But the men just wait for the weakest one to break off from the herd and they move her. And what practical application does ballet have in the real world? What? Smith, I need that file. Yes, sir. <laughs> and when they leave ballet, watch this. One arm is always like this. It's always like that. I think they're checking for glasses on their butt. That's what I think they're doing. I've learned a lot. I've learned that the way to keep a marriage healthy is to find ways to keep the romance alive. So for her birthday, I surprised her with a cruise. Very nice. Evidently, you're supposed to go together. All right. <laughs> Why anybody goes on a cruise for romance is beyond me. Because all you do is eat. And you eat so much, by the time you get back to your room, you're in pain. <laughs> Don't touch me. Get away. Ow. Oh, oh. Get away. Get away. Oh, oh, oh I want to die. Oh, 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 oh. What time is it? Midnight buffet. Okay, let's go. <laughs> 
I think if you're single and you are looking, life is like a big Easter egg hunt. All the good eggs are taken and everyone who's left is either cracked or spoiled. I think it's very, very difficult. F. F is for female plumbing. Men, I have, I have two words, two words of advice for you on this. Beware. Do not try to understand what the other half of the species goes through. You cannot. They have a full reproductive system. You do not. You just have a starter set. Now here's where women have got it all over men. Oh man. Women have got like 10 million magazines, all with one subject. How to get the guy. Tells you how to style your hair, what style to wear, how to talk with flair, how to sit in a chair, how to slim your derriere, how to look like you don't care when you bear as much as you dare as you lure him into your lair. <laughs> it's like women are a spider in a web going, calm, calm to me, calm. And men were just walking along going, ba 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 And we hear, calm. <laughs> you sure are pretty. Calm, calm. <laughs> now, as men, we think this attraction phase is going to last forever. <laughs> Before we were married, my wife had this long hair. Calm to me, calm. The minute we got married, she walked down the aisle, went into the beauty parlor, came out looking like Mo. <laughs> well, you cut your hair, sweetly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, anything remotely sexy was pushed out by a mountain of flannel. Are you even in there? I, I've married a bedspread. Where are you in there? Anytime I tried to get her to dress a little saucy for me, she acted like she was getting a root canal. <laughs> I was like, fine, I'll be your hunka hunka burning love. <laughs> one time, I remember this so well, one time she dressed up to the nine. She looked great. She looked so hot, I wrote her a thank you note, really. It meant. <laughs> These are my best buddies. This is my small group. We read one book that said you would score many points in your relationship with your wife if you sent her a card that says, I love you for no reason. <laughs> that is a great idea. So we sent out Bill. He went out and got four cards. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. Four of the exact same cards. We all wrote in them, honey, I love you for no reason. Mailed them off, congratulated each other for being such wonderful husbands. We did not know that women talk to each other. Came home on a Wednesday, there's the card. I'm expecting the many love blessings to flow by. Wife came in and got your card. Well, just wanted to say I love you for no reason. We know it's funny. <laughs> because I was talking to Lisa, and she got this exact same card. Uh huh. Now, I'm saying uh huh. That's what the face is saying, but inside it's going danger, danger, danger. Run, buy diamonds, buy a car, buy a house, get out of here now, go! So we called Karen and Janine and they got the exact same card as well. Would that be a bad thing? She gave me the card back and said, when you want to tell me you love me, just tell me. Walked out. Ooh. What happened here? We had to call an emergency men's group meeting. 
and look up in the male-female scoring dictionary and, and find out the group cards get no points. We did not know that. It took us years to live that one down. Anytime any wife got any gift, oh, did the other wives get this too? No, it's just you. <laughs> but as much as I love my wife, we almost broke up about a year ago. It was not over a woman, not over money. It was over the one thing that will break up any marriage. I had surgery and I recuperated at home. <laughs> About a year ago, I had hernia surgery. I was picking up manhole covers, looking for Satan. I strained myself. <laughs> now, the surgery itself is a breeze. It's outpatient surgery. They wheel you in, cut you open, wheel you back out. And they timed the drugs to last right up to your front door. <laughs> Get out of the car. How you doing? I'm doing fine. That's pretty good. Aww. <laughs> Aww. What can I do for you? Kill me now! made it in the bed, <laughs> safe. I'm going nowhere. This area is closed for repairs. <laughs> when you have abdominal surgery, breathing is hard, coughing is painful, a sneeze is considered suicide. <laughs> so I'm not moving. But my doctor told me to drink about 30 gallons of water a day to flush out my system. And when I got to the relieving zone, I was faced with a problem that I never thought I'd have. Basically, it's this. If you can't bend over and your pajama bottoms are on the ground, I finally shuffled over to the medicine cabinet, got some dental floss and some safety pins, and went deep PJ fishing. <laughs> I was pretty proud of myself. The main problem, I think, with surgery is personal hygiene. After about four days, I was pretty rank. I had that double-sided pillow head mohawk thing going on there. <laughs> yeah, a Floby couldn't go through that hair, it was nothing. <laughs> hadn't shaved, hadn't showered, had a lot of dental floss and safety pins hanging from my pajamas. <laughs> I was basically your stud muffin of love right about now. <laughs> Give us a kiss. <laughs> but that didn't bother my wife. It was day five. Day five, I got to shower, I got to shave, I felt human again. I was snuggled up in bed, and I just called for my wife. That's all I did. I just called for my wife. And she snapped. <laughs> the door flew open. <laughs> If you ring that bell <laughs> one more time, I will personally rip your stitches out myself. <laughs> so far this morning, I've made you breakfast in bed, brought you your pill, flipped your pillows from the hot side to the cool side, <laughs> took care of the kids. I'm late for work. What? Do you want? 
I can't reach the remote over there. <laughs> we no longer have a remote, just so you know. <laughs> It was crushed upon impact with my skull, quite frankly. <laughs> all I wanted was some sympathy. That's all I wanted. So when she went off to work, I called my mom. <laughs> she wasn't home, dad picked up. every day. I sewed it up myself and went back to work the next day. What's your problem? What is it about babies that make total strangers come over and ask if they can hold your child? I don't know you. This is the most precious thing in the world to me. Here. Do we do this with anyone else? Oh, your wife is gorgeous. May I hold her? <laughs> Come on, give us a kiss. Give us a kiss. Give us a kiss. <laughs> when she was two, she took a jar of honey and she just poured it into the carpet. <laughs> Must have taken a long time. The whole thing was gone. <laughs> then she took a jar of sugar poured it on top of that, stepped in it, and walked around the house. I came in, I looked at it, I looked at her. Ah! Ah, 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 ah. 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 hit me, wait a minute, we're renting. <laughs> Honey, it's time to move again, sorry. When my daughter was in fifth grade, she had to build a science project for a science fair. And she was furious because I made her do it by herself. Now, I'm not moral or anything, just in her fourth grade class, I spent about three weeks putting together a California mission out of sugar cubes and I only got a C minus on it, so I was not going there again. <laughs> but this science fair was like a living testimony to man's never ending ability to help his children cheat. Oh, the scientific knowledge of these 10 year olds was amazing. There are exhibits on molecular cloning. Hydrogen cars. There was a combo nuclear reactor easy bake oven. <laughs> but there was one exhibit that I'll never forget. We walked around the corner, we saw it. And it was made by someone who obviously remembered that morning <laughs> that the science fair was that night. They had ripped out the sign of a cardboard box, just ripped it out, and written in crayon why things float. That's all it said, nothing else, just why things float. And below it was a bucket full of water with a rubber duck in it. <laughs> and for some reason, there was no name attached. It was like a shrine to the unknown procrastinator. <laughs> and from that point on, anytime we ever saw something stupid, we go, that's about as dumb as a duck in a bucket. Look at that right there. My daughter has officially reached the pre-teen stage, otherwise known as Teenagerus Embarrassmentius. <laughs> this is where a teenager can actually die of embarrassment. When this happens, certain involuntary reactions occur. The hand comes up, hits the head. The eyes roll back. The spine collapses. 
And the word dad becomes a four-syllable word. Dad. If you can hit all four at once, you win the parental daily double. Dad. My wife and I chaperoned her sixth grade roller skating party. Now this is where parents are not even allowed to look at their offspring. They're skating, the parents are sequestered off in the corner, huddled in a mask, going alms, alms for the parents, alms, alms. Well, I broke away from the pack because I'm gonna win the parental daily double. Sweetheart! Is that the boy you like? I mean, you think he's cute, really? Oh, um, I, in case you have an accident, I brought some extra underwear for you. Let me find you here. I, I couldn't find Princess Jasmine. I hope Little Mermaid's okay. She skates away. Dad. The other parents come out. High five. Good job. You won. Good job. High five. There you go. This is what I live for. I am afraid I've warped my children. My son came home one day in third grade and said, Dad, um, everybody else in school, their parents go to a thing called work. <laughs> and sometimes they don't get home till after dinner. I said, I know. And if you study, that could happen to you. Before Christmas, my daughter was chosen to play Mary at a song in front of church. Now, that's not painful. That's a joy. About two days before the performance, she had braces put on. And they stuck a palate widener up in the roof of her mouth. This is something where they give you a little torture key. And every night, as a parent, you have to crank it back. I love you. Ah! <laughs> she held it in till she got in the car. And then she just started crying. She goes, Dad, listen to me. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to sneak in front of the church in two days. <laughs> well, maybe by Sunday it'll be okay. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Salutation, separate. <laughs> I am Mary, and I am a child, and his name should be called Jesus. Are you serious? <laughs> what, what can I do? I, do you want me to go beat up your orthodontist? What, what, what can I do? The pain. You feel everything. Braces. <laughs> Arrow in the heart. Didn't get asked to dance. <laughs> Called a name at school. <laughs> Puberty. <laughs> Everything. Now this one turned out all right. She practiced. Two days later, she sang. She sounded like an angel. She was wonderful. But if you listen carefully, when the shepherds left, you could hear Mary go, Shh, just a little bit. You could hear that. <laughs> he is a great kid. We have so much fun together. We read comics, we watch movies, we play baseball. It's, it's, it's a great time, but he has been born into the laziest generation that has ever walked the face of this earth. A few years ago, he got an automatic sucker twirler. You stick the sucker in, you turn it on, it turns the sucker for you. My son would walk around the house, ah. Generation so lazy they can't even lick on their own. Private schools drive me crazy because I spend a fortune to keep them in private school. 
but every other week, they have a new fundraiser. I have enough wrapping paper to cover the Western Hemisphere. I have enough band candy to feed Central Africa. I have Time Magazine until Christ comes back. That's what it says on the label, until Christ comes back. Just the other day, I put my daughter in her first apartment. I mean, she's only 10, but we were not getting along at all. She were not. I drove a carpool of these girls to school. I'm making it to heaven on that alone. Honest to goodness line that came from the back seat. I'm so embarrassed. The teacher made me get up in front of the entire class and like, read? And she knows I'm growing out my bangs. And I do not want to be seen. Could you die? That line is like a gauntlet being thrown down because the other girls have to top her now. I know what you mean. That happened to me in first grade because I was the only one intelligent enough to read. I could read when I was two. I could read when I was an embryo. I just looked over at my son and said, don't ever turn into that. He looked back at me and went, uh. <laughs> We decided to take a family vacation. I said, all right, let's go someplace where I can understand everyone. Let's go to the UK. We went over to England, couldn't understand a word. <laughs> Anybody said. We took one of those double-decker buses and a tour around London, and our, our guide spoke a charming dialect of mumble. Well, here we go, uh, West, uh, Mr. Abbey, which is right across the Big Bed, and of course, that's why I could pull a bit where all the name. What? We went to Scotland. Couldn't understand the cab driver at all. Look at the end better. Where can I take you? I'm sorry, just a little bit slower. Look at the end better. Where can I take you? A wee bit slower. Welcome to Edinburgh. Where can I take ye? We just walked to the hotel. That was it. As she was growing up, as my daughter was growing up, it was rather tumultuous, shall we say. Uh, because she'd say black, I'd say white, we'd lock horns. Just so much fun. <laughs> and, and during one particularly joyful time. <laughs> she gave my wife and myself a card and a cassette and said, just get dressed up and go. So, well, why? Just, just get dressed up and go. We got dressed up, we got in the, in the car and we, we opened up the card and, and it was, was $20 for the cover charge for a jazz club we've been talking about going to. We put the cassette in and it said everything that she couldn't say to us. She said, look, I know it's been hard. We've been fighting a lot lately, but I just wanted to let you know, I love you. I'm glad you're my parents. Everything's going to be fine. I was like, wow. Wow. That, that is what makes it all worthwhile. And then we came home and found out she'd thrown a huge party at our house that <laughs> night. Uh, <laughs> but I was okay because it was so sweet, I thought, what she did. I, I, I'm so upset that you work your whole life to get somewhere. And when you finally get there, your hair decides it's not coming with you. <laughs> I mean, I've still got most of mine, but my forehead's a lot higher than it used to be. I don't so much comb my hair as sculpted now. And I was, I was kind of complaining about this one night in a set, and the lady came up to me after the show and said, well, you know, your hair falling out is just the same as a woman's bosom sagging. I said, I'm sorry, but I don't believe your bosom falls off. I don't believe you wake up in the morning and find a, a bosom on your pillow. You don't take off your brassiere and find a bosom in it. No one has ever accused you of having a bad bosom over. 
No, you're staying in the same general vicinity. Mine, leave. If my hair was just sagging, I'd walk around in a wonder hat, okay? In Hollywood today, what do you see? Those sheer fashions where the women are wearing their undergarments so you can see them? Wasn't this one of the original signs of senility? <laughs> Grandma, the bra and the girdle go on the inside. I'm very curious as to who invented our stuff. But not the big stuff. I don't care about the cars and the phone and that kind of stuff. That doesn't matter to me. I want to know who invented Jello and bagpipes. Now, it may shock you to know that Jell-O, of course, is made from gelatin, but gelatin is made from cow and horse hooves. Who invented that? <laughs> Bunch of cowboys sitting around going, you know, I'll bet you we've eaten that whole cow. But if we take them hooves, grind them up, add cherry flavoring, <laughs> sliced bananas, some water and then freeze it, we got dessert! <laughs> bagpipes! Do you know what bagpipes are? They were made from sheep's bladders. <laughs> Who invented that? <laughs> hey, McGillicuddy! <laughs> There's a pint in it for you! If you'll blow in that sheep's bladder and squeeze it so it sounds like amazing grace. <laughs> well, of course the sheep's alive. That's what the pint is for. <laughs> ba 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 ba. I had a friend in high school. To rebel against her parents, she had a tattoo. Of Tweety Bird. Tattooed on her hip. That was her big rebellion. I saw her at our reunion, asked how the tattoo was. She said, Well, Tweety looks more like Big Bird now. It's a. Uh... <laughs> Be careful how you rebel, I guess is the point there. Good day to you all. I bring you greetings from my brothers at Our God is Bigger Than Your God Monastery. <laughs> Today I shall be reading from the Book of Bob, <laughs> beginning with chapter one. And lo, when the lights go out in the movie theater and one continues to talk, or is rude, or explains the plot to a dim-witted friend in a loud voice, <laughs> or munches on popcorn and candy with his mouth open, he shall be called unclean. <laughs> and lo, if you take your car in to be repaired, and the mechanic estimateth the cost to be $50, but when thou picketh it up, he charges 500 he shall be called the evil one. <laughs> and from that day forward, every time the evil mechanic goeth to a restaurant, he shall be charged ten times the normal price for a meal. <laughs> and when he asks for an explanation, he shall be told that he ordered a difficult hamburger. <laughs> and it took much longer to prepare than originally thought. <laughs> and the lettuce had to be installed by an expert. <laughs> and they had to send away for the bun. <laughs> Thus he shall reap his own reward. And lo, whosoever shall go out on a casual date and promise the girl he will call within the week and does not call, then he shall be called Dead Sea Scum. <laughs> and on the eighth day, the woman he hath wronged shall rise up with twenty of her friends who have been like scorned, and they shall walk over the man's small toes and high heels and show no mercy. <laughs> One might wonder about the Spartan lifestyle of a monk and how we manage without the company and affection of a good woman. <laughs> Do 
chapter four. <laughs> I, I did a show for a group of nuns one time, or a gaggle of nuns, I'm not sure of the exact term. <laughs> and they, they were out of full uniform. I mean, they weren't nudist nuns, but they were, they were like in, 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 in half a habit or a demi-wimple, I don't know what you call it, but they, they were very casual, it's casual Sunday, and, and I asked them, what do you do all day? And they said they get up at 4 a.m. to pray. 4 a.m.? Ladies, you're married to God. Sleep in. I'm Presbyterian. We're afraid if we raise our hands in church, God might call on us. We just built a brand new sanctuary, as a matter of fact. Couldn't afford it. Did it anyway. Our slogan was, maybe God will come back before we have to pay for it. I've spent my life trying to communicate to my daughter, to my son, that God loves them, but in my language, not theirs. As such, I have rewritten the Bible for my daughter and her friends. I'm calling it the I Am All Bible, and I'm going to do a small little portion of it in the New Testament where Peter denies Christ. <clears throat> and they're all... You're with him, and I'm all, nah, -uh. and they're all, we like saw you, and I'm all, as if, and they're all, it was you, and I'm all, major as if, and then this cock-like crowed, and I realized I had so denied him, so I wept, whatever. Okay, so that's uh, for my children. <laughs> but despite all the rewards of being a dad, I can say, without fear of contradiction, that if the Apostle Paul had teenagers, Christianity would have been nipped in the bud. <laughs> We're going to Corinth again? <laughs> we just got back from Ephesus. Everywhere we go, you're beaten, you're robbed, you're stoned. Do you know how embarrassing that is? Why don't you just write these people? My ultimate goal is to get to heaven and be with my family and actually have dinner with my kids and finish an entire sentence. What I can't wait for, and the, the best thing is going to be listening to these stories, all the old stories, because you know everyone's going to try and outdo each other. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. You were shipwrecked. You were thrown in jail. You were stoned. <laughs> I was swallowed by a whale. A whale! I was being digested! <laughs> I lost everything I own. My entire family had to scrape boils off my body with a shard of pottery because God made a bet! <laughs> I had to keep a thousand wives and concubines satisfied. Do the math on that one. <laughs> I wandered the desert for 40 years. 40 years! Had nothing to eat but bread off the ground and occasional boy. And every day, a million people would come up to me and say, Are we there yet? <laughs> ha! Ha ha! I was raised in the Great Depression.
Terry blocks of ice in my back, door to door. Frostbite every day. Had an ungrateful son who made fun of me in front of crowds of people. What do you top that? When Jesus left, he said that he went ahead to build many mansions for us. And he said, if that wasn't true, I wouldn't say so. He's been working on it for 2,000 years. And he's a carpenter, so it should be fairly spectacular. <laughs> now, obviously, Christianity is it's my worldview. That's how I see things. And so it drives me crazy. You just don't know how much it hurts when I hear people trying to demote him. Going, well, no, no, he's a good teacher. That's all. He's just a good teacher. Do we normally kill our good teachers? <laughs> and Mrs. Smith is teacher of the year. String her up! <laughs> the man claimed to be God. I don't know how many teachers put that on their resume, but I'm thinking the list is pretty small. C.S. Lewis says you got three options. He is a liar, he is a lunatic, or he's the Lord. If you're honest, pick one. But choose wisely. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Every movie I see makes him out to be such a wimp. No. Historically, you've got to understand that he was a carpenter in the first century, which means he's buff. He's working with wood. He's making oxen yokes. He, he's making doors. He's fastening them by hand. He's picking them up. He's walking around. No, our Savior was a stud. <laughs> if you're going to cast somebody, cast Arnold. <laughs> Disciples, <laughs> throw out your net on the other side of the boat. See, now it's just filled with fish. I will help you girl him and bring it in. <laughs> Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, that I will say, hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be back. to have a baby? I'm a hundred. Sarah's ninety. Let's adopt. <laughs> I know you are all wise, but would you want to live with a ninety-year-old pregnant woman? I don't think so. I... I'll say push. You'll say I'm tired. You push. Eh, not a good idea. Well, you can knock a man down in a chariot race. I slander my gods all over the place. I'll do anything that you I want to do. But, oh, Moses, lay off for my Jews, or don't you? Rounding out our top ten, we had hail, locusts, and who can forget, three days of darkness. Coming up, our number one plague. But first, a request. It goes out to Pharaoh from a man named Moses who writes, Let my people go. Delilah says, stupid is, a stupid does. <laughs> so I'll let her tie me up. And all these Philistines run in, and she says, run, Samson, run. But I could not because she had given me a haircut, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Dear God, you delivered me from Goliath, from the jealousy of Saul, made me king over all I survey. I shall worship you as long as the sun rises in the east and sets in the... Oh my goodness, who was that woman taking a bath? Sheba. Oh my, oh my, oh my. <laughs> because I used to worship God when I was just a lad. The king would give me nose a tweak and say that I was bad. But then one day he passed a law on which he stubbed my toes. I broke the law and took the fall, and this is how it goes. Oh, me and Shadrach and Abednego were thrown into a furnace. Turn up the heat some seven times, you still will fail to burn us. There's a lesson here for all of us to take to heart and learn us. Always have an angel there when you're thrown into a furnace. I'm the little, little, I'm the little. <laughs> <laughs> 
when they tossed Daniel into my den, I said, put him up, put him up. <laughs> but I couldn't eat him. I was afraid to. <laughs> People of Nineveh, I've just been vomited upon your shores after spending three days in the belly of the great fish. Repent, or I shall not bathe. Okay, you were not, all right, you were not going to believe what just happened. All right, we were out in the fields by night, tending our flocks, which is what we do, when from out of nowhere comes this angel, and it says that our Savior has been born in the city of David, and then this whole host of angels appear. So we run, and we're in the city, and there, there's this little couple in a little manger, and there's the baby, there's the Christ child. And this is God. And so we fall down and we worship it and we go back and we're praising God. And that's when we got back and found out your sheep were missing. I'm really sorry. I have no idea. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. I'm not going to be wearing camel hair, eating locust my whole life. No, no, no. I got a cousin now. I am not fit to tie his sandal, but when he goes into his kingdom, family sticks together. Bada boom, bada bing, know what I mean? There we go, okay. Ha 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 He touched my eyes and said, your sins are forgiven. Wow. And I could see. Wow. And they asked me, who was that man? And I said, I can honestly say I've never seen him before in my life. <laughs> Every time Jesus comes over, I cook and I clean. But does my sister help? Oh no. She's too busy sitting at the feet of our Lord, worshiping Him, but if I ask for help, all I hear is Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> Psst. Psst. Is it just me, or does Judas give you the creeps? <laughs> well, Jesus, fancy meeting you here in the garden. Hope you don't mind, but I brought along a few of my Roman friends. Are you sweating blood or just happy to see me? <laughs> this just in. Jesus of Nazareth, crucified on Friday, is risen from the dead. Resting in peace until early this morning when a man of light rolled away the two-ton stone in front of his tomb. No, I'm just saying. I, I, I'm just saying. Oh, I'll say, oh, I'll say, I'm, oh, I'm not going to believe he's alive. Oh, I'll say, oh, I'm not going to believe he's alive until I, until, oh, until I stick my hand in his side and, and my finger in his... My Lord, my God, that's a hole, all right. <laughs> well, Ananias, guess you got to ask yourself a question. When you sold your property, did you give the disciples five shekels or six? Might as well warn you, you lie to the Holy Spirit, he's liable to tear your head clean off. <laughs> he's only the most powerful weapon known to mankind. So I gotta ask you, do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> so, love is patient, love is kind, love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You might even say, all you need is love. <laughs> say, Paul, that's not bad. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, the end of mankind as we know it. The four horsemen of the apocalypse destroying a third of mankind. The Antichrist. Drinking the blood of the saints with the whore of Babylon. Strange, yes. Bizarre, undoubtedly. But that's what happens if you take the mark of the beast. Because now you're stuck in the tribulation zone. <laughs> I 
icy streets of gold, red roses too, God's paradise for me and for you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Oh, yeah. That's it.